Welcome to the Babe Ruth Birthplace and Museum. I'm Sean Hearn. The mission of the Babe Ruth Birthplace Foundation is to preserve, interpret, and celebrate Maryland's great sports heritage. That includes Babe Ruth, Baltimore's Orioles, Colts, and Ravens, as well as our many Olympic, collegiate, and amateur athletes from across the state. Tonight's virtual speaker series program features Daryl Hill and Johnny Holiday. As a Terp in 1963, Hill was the first African American to play in a major Southern sports conference. His experiences were groundbreaking. Programs like these are made possible by donors and sponsors like you. Please consider making a donation to the Babe Ruth Birthplace Foundation and tune in to future virtual programs offered by the museum. Now before I turn it over to our MC tonight, Johnny Holiday, please watch this video presentation about Daryl Hill. Okay. <clears throat> Maryland Sports Hall of Fame. This place, this feel, me. I had no idea when I was playing with Roger Stoddard over at Navy, not only would I end up here, that it would change the trajectory of my life and college football forever. I'm no Jackie Robinson. I think I know what it's like to stand in his shoes. This end zone was the best end zone to catch the ball in because the students used to sit right here. Caught a crossing pattern right here broke to the sidelines right here, got to the 10, made a dead stop, boom! Blasted in the end zone, dove in the end zone, just barely making it for a touchdown. Got mobbed by the students who all ran out of the stands and jumped on me. I got, got roughed up more by the students in the celebration than I did during the game, but it was a nice feeling. If I wasn't so old, I'd be in action. <laughs> so um, I'm Daryl Hill. I played football here at the University of Maryland from 1962 through 1964. I was the first African-American to play sports here in Maryland. First of all, my mother had this burning desire for me to go to a military academy. So to get into the academy, one of the criteria was how excellent you are in ex extracurricular activities. So they all tried out for the football team. I was out there on the football field. There was a young man, and he was running side to side, throwing bullets on the dead run. And I said, what the heck? I said, who are you? He said, well, my name is Roger. I said, well, Roger, you sure can throw. He said, well, I noticed that you can catch pretty good, too. Of course, that was Roger Staubach. Sometime during the following spring, I decided that I was going to complete my plebe year at Navy and then transfer. One day, I get this call from Lee Corso. Corso says, we want you to go to Maryland. I said, yeah, coach, I understand, but you play in the Atlantic Coast Conference. It's a segregated conference. Corso said, yep, that's just the point. When the news hit the press, all hell broke loose in the ACC. South Carolina and Clemson threatened the conference with dissolving it, or at least they're leaving it. Frank Howard was the head coach and athletic director at Clemson. He said, all right, you bring that boy down here, and we ain't going to let him leave that arena alive. I promise you that. They turned to me, Corso said, <clears throat> do you want to come here now after hearing all of that? And I said, sure. Darrell Hill came to the University of Maryland in 1963 from the Naval Academy, and there he became the first African American to receive a full scholarship in any sport from any school south of the Mason-Dixon line. That season, the wide receiver set a single season school record with 43 receptions, despite significant racial pushback. Maryland broke the ice in college sports. Maryland was the Jackie Robinson of college sports, not Daryl Hill. This entire university backed me up. I never once on this campus was called a name or put into a derogatory situation. 
And if it did come up, my teammates and others were quick to defend me. The legacy and the story to be told, I think is the most important factor of the matter. I want everybody to understand, especially the African-American students here at College Park, what happened and why. And so going in the Hall of Fame provides a platform for me and others to tell this story. Having the name on the building, Billy Jones said to me, Daryl, he said, one thing about our name on this building, the movies will go along, the articles will pass by, but the building is going to be standing there for a long time. Yeah. All right, Johnny, take it away. Well, you have seen a magnificent tribute to someone who made such a tremendous impact on the University of Maryland, Daryl Hill, an old friend of mine. We go way back and we're going to talk all about how he did what he did. He set the tone for schools, not only in the ACC, but any school south of the border of, of the Mason-Dixon line to understand that African-Americans deserve just the same chance as everybody else did. And his story is incredible. I know you will enjoy hearing from Daryl Hill. Daryl, it's great to see you again. I assume you are there somewhere. I'll I am here. I'm here. Oh, there, there you are. Thank here you. Here I am. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. Just fine. I, I looked at that video tribute of you going into the Maryland State Athletic Hall of Fame, long overdue, incidentally. And you can almost close your eyes if you're a Maryland football fan and think back to the 1962, three, four years of number 25, doing exactly how you demonstrated, catching that ball, going for the end zone and the students going crazy. But before we touch on that, it all started with your mom and dad because they were number one, you're a local guy, grew up in this area. And your mom was an educator and your dad was a businessman and they took education very, very seriously. Yes, they did. Uh, there was never a question about going to college. Uh, you know, that was just a given fact, football or no football. I was heading that way. Uh, my mother was a teacher in the DC public school system and she was dedicated to the inner city children. Even though she had a PhD, she taught junior high school at Shaw Junior High, right in the heart of Washington. Uh, her dream was for me to go to a military academy. Uh, at the time, uh, it was a great, it was before Vietnam and uh, there was, tremendous honor and there were only 12 African Americans out of 4,000 midshipmen at the Naval Academy, by the way. Uh, so uh, I went, she kind of tricked me. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, I went to Xavier because I, I was only, I, my senior in high school, I, I was player here in Washington, but I was only 15 years old. <laughs> so I went to Gonzaga, by the way, kudos to Gonzaga and Caleb Williams. Heisman Trophy winner. Oh yeah, sure. I, I, Johnny, I tried real hard to get him to come to Maryland, but uh, he, he wanted bigger and better horizons. And now here he is with the Heisman. So, you know, everybody's happy. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm proud of the school. And, uh, you know, my mother sent me to Gonzaga because it was one of the top academic schools in the area. Uh, and ironically, I was there on an academic scholarship, not a uh, athletic scholarship. Um, they used to have an interest exam and I was fortunate enough to score second in the exam. And so I got a scholarship there and uh, it led to bigger and better things. So it, here it, I am. When, when you were at Gonzaga in 1959, you guys, I think, won the city championship. We did. We won the city championship at uh, 1959 against Eastern High School that played in old Griffith Stadium wow. 20 years ago. And, and you were, besides football, you also ran the four, what, 400? And also 
uh, the long jump? Uh, yeah, I was the uh, league record holder in both events, 400 meters. At, 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 at the time, it was called a 440-yard four, dash and, and also the long jump. And uh, <laughs> funny thing about that, I got invited to the Mount Sac Relays in California where the best high school runners, and I, I had never lost in the 400, 400, 400 meters. I, <laughs> I got out there with the best runners in the country and finished oh, next sure. to last. <laughs> Just goes to show you what it was a surprise to me, but <laughs> it was a, it was a great experience. At least I made it to the finals. You got to anyway. tell us a story about you and your buddy Ken Price because you did things together, and you both had the exact same nickname, Apple Pie. <laughs> yeah, we call each other Apple Pie. You know, so if you heard a conversation with with him, he and I right now, you would hear. Pie, I did this. Yeah, Pie, I heard about it. Pie, I was over at your mother. Yeah, you know, it, it's kind of weird. That, uh, he was a football player, a competitor that, uh, at uh, Catholic High School in D.C., John Carroll High School. He was a running back like I was in high school. And uh, I was a little more highly publicized and, and sought after. So I, the colleges, they were trying to recruit me. I said, I'll come to your school. Uh, if you give my friend Ken Price, who's also a good player, a football scholarship also. Uh, the big boys, Notre Dame and Penn State, Syracuse said, no thanks. Uh, but Xavier University, which uh, was in the MAC, what is the MAC now, uh, they've since dropped the program. But uh, they said, OK. And uh, he and I wound up there uh, you know, playing ball at Xavier. I left after my freshman year uh, and he stayed and became their, you know, star running back. <laughs> and so uh, they got, they got the best end of the deal. They got the better player of the two. Well, my us. mother who had this vision of me going into the Naval Academy one day, uh, that freshman year, Xavier, around March or April, she said, if I can get you uh, admitted to the United States Naval Academy, will you go? Well, I knew the, the admissions had closed in January, so I just smiled. I said, sure, Bob, I, of course, I'll go. And, you know, I didn't think much of it. And about a month later, Pi comes running up to the room and said, you got a letter from the White House. You got a letter from the White House. I said, okay, I opened it and said, congratulations. You've been uh, appointed a, <laughs> a plea at the at, uh, United States Naval Academy, report to Bancroft Hall, uh, 0800, uh, 26 June, signed John F. Kennedy. <laughs> I said, holy mackerel, here I am at the Naval Academy and didn't even know I was going. Wow. I was wondering why my mother let me go to Xavier because she was bent on my, if not going to a military academy, I'd going to an Ivy League school, going to Harvard or Yale. Uh, and she let me go to Xavier. That's why she was working on this all along. I just wasn't old enough my senior year to go to Navy. You had to be 17. And I was only 16 when I graduated from high school. So I couldn't go. Uh, but she stashed it away. And uh, I wound up. She was in cahoots, I think, with the football people at Navy. But who knows? <laughs> I wound up there and playing with uh, one of the greatest athletes I ever had pleasure to meet and that was Roger Staubach. Well as as on that plebe team, I think you won eight and one that year. And yes. I, and I think there was a kid named Jerry Fishman. The one loss <laughs> came to Maryland, right? Yes. Now, correct me if I'm wrong on the story about Fishman and you, that he was a heck of a tough tackler. And he hit you with a shot one time and said, I'm gonna be on you all day long. Yeah, no, what and, he said was <laughs> he picked me up and he says, I'm going to be your biggest nightmare this afternoon. <laughs> and, I, and I said, okay, Jerry. And he was a tough dude. And I played a lot of football, you know, college and pro. I, he was as you know, hard a hit tackler as I've ever met. Well, weren't you, weren't you in Stallback? Didn't you have a little pack going between the two of you that you were going to both leave the academy? He stayed. Yeah, we we, he we talked about trying to leave as a package. Uh, of course, yeah. it was a yeah. major league feeding frenzy. <laughs> and uh, Roger was very close to his family and his mother. 
and uh, football department put a lot of Navy football department contacted our parents and you know tried to talk them into keeping us there. Roger stayed, and I left. And uh, you know the rest of the story. He oh, yeah, he wound yeah. up being the number one player in the country, Heisman Trophy winner, deservedly so. And both you guys wind up, of course, in the NFL. You played with the Jets for a while. And, of course, Roger went on to a, a Hall of Fame career. Then Lee, how did Lee Corso come in the picture? Because Corso was at Maryland at that time. And Tom Nugent was the coach for the Terrapins then. But he, and he yeah. wanted to get an African-American on that football team. Well, this was interesting. Corso was the uh, coach of the, 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 the freshman game uh, with Navy. And I, I had a pretty good game, a couple touchdowns, I think. And uh, when, the, when the word got out that I was leaving, the first person to show up was Corso and said, we'd like you to come to College Park and uh, visit. And I said, for what purpose, Coach? <laughs> he said, well, we want to offer you a scholarship to play football at Maryland. And I said, well, uh, Coach, you forgot what conference you're playing in. <laughs> it's Atlantic Coast Conference is a segregated conference. And he said, that's just the point. Uh, I think that uh, it's time for that to change. Uh, the Board of Trustees in Maryland has authorized us to go forward with, with you. And uh, he said, I don't want to put the pressure on you, but <laughs> there's a lot riding on you doing well <laughs> in this process. And they, and they let it ride, uh, Johnny. It, it, there were two years went by before Maryland or any other school in the ACC recruited another African-American. They waited to see what happened with me. Uh, fortunately, nothing bad. <laughs> so, uh, but what, uh, what happened, at, anything happened at Gonzaga because you were the first also at Gonzaga. They had no African-Americans in their team. Or the no, team. They, they, they didn't. And uh, it wasn't a big deal, you know, yeah. Gonzaga. Yeah treated me evenly with even handedly and uh and, and quite well the good jesuits uh, right <laughs> yeah the good jesuits i love the good jesuits <laughs> so you know I, I i'm active you know still with the school and uh was was very proud to see kale win the other day well the one thing i i, I was really caught with you had said over and over again you're not in this thing to break color barriers. You're not here to be Jackie Robinson. You're here to be Daryl Hill and to play football. And still you did it with such class and with such determination, or maybe, I don't know if there was determination. I don't know if in the back of your mind, you said, I'm gonna be the pace setter. I'm gonna get this thing done, no matter what obstacle I have to face. And you did that. You face some obstacles that are incredible when people hear what you went through especially on the road in the ACC. Yeah, I, you know, I was probably young and dumb. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> we, all, we all were, believe me. I mean, I, when I, when Corso was trying to get me to go to Maryland, because I was going someplace else, Penn State, I think, I can't remember. But uh, he, I said, Coach, look, I'm not trying to be Jackie Robinson here. I want to be a normal college student. I want to drink beer, and chase girls, and, you know, have fun and uh, not be under the microscope that I'll be under if I come to Maryland. And he looked at me, he said, so you're scared, huh? Boy, that was the right button to push. <laughs> so, okay. And here well, I come. Yeah, it, so when you, when you get to Maryland and I think the thing down at Clemson, Frank Howard was the coach and the athletic director at Clemson at the time. And he was adamant, as were all the other Southern schools in the ACC. Hey, this is the way we've done it. This is the way we're going to continue to do it. If, if you bring that guy on your football team down to Clemson, we're not playing. And I believe it was Dr. Elkins said, Wilson Tom Elkins. Nugent said, we're coming. Get ready for us. We're coming. And Daryl Hill is playing. Yeah, they threatened to leave the conference. Uh, and Dr. Wilkins, Wilson Elkins, who was the president of Maryland, he said, you got to do what you got to do. But we're going to sign him. First of all, giving me a scholarship was a big deal. So I was the first African-American to receive an athletic scholarship in any sport, in any team below the Mason-Dixon line. 
a major team below the Mason Dixon. So that was a big kind of deal, you know, offering an African American an athletic scholarship, which, uh, of course, the the two southernmost teams in the conference, South Carolina and Clemson, were firmly against and threatened to leave the conference. And uh, Frank Howard <laughs> said, "You know, we, we're not going to play if you bring him." And so when the when when I finally signed and went to practice, <laughs> they they interviewed, they called Frank Howard and said, All right, he's out there. <laughs> you know, what you gonna do? Frank kind of laughed with he had that big old stogie that you always know, oh, yeah. in this skinny <laughs> red hat. And he kind of laughed. He said, Well, South Carolina plays them first, and that's their problem. <laughs> that's the universe of South Carolina I'm referring to, who was in the ACC at the time. <laughs> he said, Let them worry about it. You know, we play them at the end of the season. Uh, but then he also, when, the, when it came time for me to come down there, he said, You know, our stadium is called Death Valley. Yeah, and he ain't gonna leave Death Valley alive. This this is coming from the athletic director and head football coach. I said, okay, we'll see. Hmm. Well, like I said, I was young and dumb. Your I didn't. your mom took the train down to watch you play, and there was no blacks were allowed in that stadium at that time. They had a certain area that they had to go to watch the game. And your mom was denied entrance, and you were in the locker room. I think you might have been in your uniform. And somebody came in and said, "You got to come out. You got to help your mother because she's got a problem." Did you take? Did you go out in your uniform or take your uniform off? I, go I took my uniform off. Well, yeah, you know, I took the shoulder pads and jersey off. I think I kept the pants on. You know, put on a sweatshirt, and I went out there. And there she was with the ticket. Uh, she had promised my, my dad and I that she wasn't going to come to this game. You know, so I, I remember the day Thursday before the game at dinner, she said, oh, no, I'm not going to go down there, you know, and Pop and I said, okay, here she is. <laughs> First, I was peeved with her when I saw her. <laughs> you know, I said, what are you doing down here? You know? and, and then uh, I said, she said, well, they won't let me in. And this little smart mouth a uh, kid student who was on the gate said, yes, lady, can't you read? No colored allowed. There were no black people in that stadium doing anything, not even selling popcorn. The blacks had to sit outside of the field on a dirt hill, uh, uh, for, you know, warmly known as Ant Hill. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and that's where they watched the game on this red dirt grass hill. And Daryl, this, um, is, this is 1964 now, right? 63, yeah, 63. 63 yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it uh, it it was interesting because during the warm-ups, <laughs> I was catching punts and passes, and if I caught one, everybody in the black section, which was packed, there, the whole <laughs> black state of North Carolina, South Carolina must have been crowded in this little hill, <laughs> and, and they would cheer, and if I dropped one, <laughs> <laughs> the white folks which <laughs> and, and, and it went on like that uh and so uh i come out there and here's mom standing there they won't let her in and this gentleman and lady walk up and uh he says I, i'm dr robert edwards i'm the chancellor of clemson university uh and i'm gonna take your mother to my box and she'll be safe you go play the game and I remember his wife, Louise, she looked at me in the eye and said, and you show him. <laughs> As by the time I got back to the field, the game had started. You know, I threw on my shoulder pads and ran out there to a chorus of booze. <laughs> and and had, had a pretty good game. In fact, uh, I set an ACC single pass catching record. This Jermaine Jackson broke the record 30 years later. <laughs> uh, so that, that, I think he caught 10 passes that day, didn't you? I did, yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and that was interesting because back then you didn't have offensive specialists and defensive specialists. So you, you had to play both ways. Uh, free substitution wasn't allowed. So I had to play safety on defense. That meant that you didn't play a whole game on offense. You would, because you had a rest at some point, you know. Yeah, so sure, yeah. 
you would sit out part of the game on offense. So the opportunity to catch balls was less than they are now where players just play singularly. Uh, a comment about that game, one thing that I learned, the kids from South Carolina, first of all, they, I mean, from Clemson, first of all, there was no name calling. There was no unnecessary roughness. And, and I was catching ball after ball and they was, they were smacking me around. There was no question about that, but legally. And that yeah. went with the territory. You start a player, you get, you get, sure. you get special attention. Yeah. And so by the third quarter, I could see them looking, the boys looking at me like, yeah, you know, they began, you know, supporting me. Then I saw a kid in the pile up and he gave me the thumbs up, you know, kind of like secretly so nobody could see him. And, and by the end of the game, they were, you know, they were with me, which told me something that there's a camaraderie among athletes. And one kid walking off the field, he said, I apologize uh, for our fans. You know, he said, we didn't, we didn't like this circus. We just wanted to play the game. And I never forgot that. 50 years later, Clemson invited me down to celebrate that game. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I looked up there at Ann Hill, still there. <laughs> And, uh, you know, with, with memories and uh, uh, Dr. Edwards invited me to his booth and I'm in, in the booth and a, a gentleman who was a big time donor for Clemson had, had done very well in his business ventures. And he said, you know, Daryl, I was in the stands as a student at Clemson that day. And he said, we watched him. He said, by the third quarter, we were cheering for you. We said, we booed you when you came and cheered for you at the end of the game. He said, it's hard as hell to cheer for somebody on Saturday and hate them on Sunday. He said, that, that was a dichotomy that I had to deal with as a person. This is this gentleman talking. And he said, he said well, it didn't make sense. <laughs> and it still doesn't today. Yeah. <laughs> I remember when they honored you at Maryland for the 50th anniversary of of what you did and the thunderous ovation you received from the Maryland fans. And then Clemson came after that. And then after they had recognized you and the 85,000 people went nuts, I think you went back up through the stands and you were shaking. Your hands must have been raw because you're shaking everybody's hand. Everybody's patting you on the back for what you did at the place that wasn't going to let you come down and play. That's that's quite true, uh, and that was that was that was quite fulfilling, and it, you know I I was shocked as I walked from the players' field up through the stands to get back up to the box, all the way up the steps, people were giving me five on both sides. Mm. The the cheer on the cheer on the field when I was on the field, I didn't know what was going on. I had said to the TV announcer who was out there with me what is that? And he said, oh, that's 85,000 people giving you a standing ovation. I said, oh my goodness. You know, it was just loud to, to the point that I couldn't imagine. Dabo swing. The minutes before kickoff, a coach, when the team leaves the warmups, goes back in the locker room and he gets the last rah-rah speech from the coach. And it's a very important thing. Davos Sweeney gave up his rah-rah speech and came out on the field to congratulate me. Wow. Of course, I, I cheer for Davo. <laughs> that day, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So to, to this day, I mean, Cle Clemson's one of my favorite teams. So, What was it uh, like when you, when you played your first game at Maryland? Because, the, you know, the fans down at Clemson were pretty rough. And some of the fans at Maryland, they weren't happy either. And they had this cannon that they shot off every time it was a, <laughs> it was a touchdown made. And I think somebody sent you a threatening, a threat, a life threatening note saying, when you first touch that ball, we're going to have, I guess it was one of the dormitories right next to a, what then was bird stadium looking right down at you. We got the gun aimed at you. Well, it, what really happened was I had a roommate who, was a freshman 
on the freshman team. So he was the first black that they brought after me. But by this time, I'm a junior before they decided to bring in another. <laughs> and uh, his name was Hill, Walter Hill. And so, you know, being a freshman at that time, he couldn't play varsity. So I had left the dorm. I was getting dressed for the game. And somebody calls the dormitory and says, let me speak to Hill. Well, Walter went to the phone and they thought he was me. And they said, all right, you go out there on that field, the, you know, Centerville Hall that overlooks the field. Now the upper deck that's there at the, at the stadium yeah. now wasn't there. And so it had a direct line of sight. We're going to be in one of those rooms with a high powered rifle. We're going to shoot you. This opening game, NC State. I tell Walter, I said, don't tell nobody. Okay? They're just trying to scare me. Don't, don't tell the coaches and certainly don't tell my dad. So uh, he didn't. And opening kickoff, I fumbled it. <laughs> I'm looking up at the door. <laughs> I'm trying to look at the door. <laughs> the ball hit me right in the chest. <laughs> Fortunately, it dropped, hit the point, and jumped right back up in my arm. So I ran on out to about the 40. <laughs> a little later in the game, they had a cannon that they had in the end zone that, that they would shoot off. And it was loud, really loud. I scored a touchdown. They shot the cannon. And I thought they had shot me. <laughs> I fell all out on the field, like, you know, in shock, looking for where I'd been shot. <laughs> and, uh, and the team, and the team, my teammates didn't know what was going on. They thought I was clowning, right? So they said, what are you doing? What are you falling all down like that? <laughs> and I said to myself, if you only do. And I never told anybody about that story for one reason. Copycats. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I want to go back. I want to go back to when, when you came to Maryland from Navy. And again, Jerry Fishman pops up. And Jerry says, Hey, Daryl, I'm Jewish. They don't like me here either. I'm sticking with you. You're sticking with me. We're going to get through this thing together. And you and him became the best of friends. Not only a heck of a ball player, too, was Fishman. <laughs> oh, buddy, was he ever. He was a tough guy who just couldn't abide racism in any way. Yeah. Some of his efforts to protect me were actually causing me issues. You know, he and I, they're, they're breaking... I'm working with some producers about a film about this story. And, and they're building it around this Jewish kid and this black kid and this friendship that we have. So we were roommates, not not on campus, but football roommates when we were traveling. You know, we, we would room together. And, you know, Fishman was do, would do crazy stuff. Like one day we were at Duke and Durham and when, you know, the, we, you arrive at the, at the city the day before the game and the team was usually was giving some free time to kind of tour around on the day before and we were walking through downtown Durham and uh there was a guy standing in front of his store and there was some pistols in the window oh. <laughs> and he's I was right there with me I don't think he saw them I'm kind of light-skinned so I maybe didn't take didn't notice that I was there maybe he just didn't care he said well those pistols that shoot that nigga on your team. <laughs> That's what he told my teammates. <laughs> we kind of said, okay. So then we go down to a Walgreens drugstore and sit down and we order milkshakes and ice cream, you know, and then we're sitting at the counter, about 10, 12 Maryland players and they give everybody stuff. And Fishman and I were down at the end and they get to me and they say, well, you know, sir, uh, they didn't say sir. They say, I don't know what they called me, but anyway, you know that we don't serve colored people in here. <laughs> and so Fishman said, oh, that ain't no problem. I don't think I got a taste for colored people today. Can we have some ice cream? <laughs> they didn't think that was funny. <laughs> the, the manager comes out, there's the big dude that bars, and Fishman, who was captain of the team, gets the boys up and said, let's go. They don't want us here. And we left. 
as he was leaving, he put his arm on the counter. He said, let me help you clean up. And he docks every plate, dish, dish and saucer into the floor all the way down the bar. <laughs> now, of course, that, that was cool, except I heard the police sirens. <laughs> and so you know who they were going to come after. And I, and I kept saying, Fishman, you know, you, you may be Jewish, and stuff, but you ain't walking around with no star David, you know, or yarmulke or they don't know you Jewish. You, you look white to them. <laughs> they, oh you, you are causing me a problem. You know, he set the Confederate flag on fire yeah. one time. Oh, yeah. you, know, yeah. you know, and he, he, he just couldn't abide, you know, racism. And, but he calls himself defending me, but half of the time, like we played at South Carolina, University of South Carolina, after the game, I'm walking off the field, dude, someone pours a drink on me. Fishman pulls the guy out the stands by one with his left hand and he's clubbing him across in the head with his helmet by the face mask. <laughs> And I said, Jerry, <laughs> come on now, <laughs> here you go. So it, he and I had this constant conflict of his so-called protecting me. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, but also, you know, causing issues. So, but we're friends today. You know, I'm proud of him. Fishman will tell you quickly. He says, I don't have any pictures of any of my family or nothing hanging on the wall in my living room. I got one picture and that's you. I said, wow. Oh. And uh, he, you know, he went on to become a very successful businessman and uh, did yeah. quite well as, as an attorney, actually. He was a tough attorney. You know, the, the, my one thought that I didn't mention about Clemson, and I think the thing that was proudest of me, uh, Wilson Elkins told my mother that night, she said, your son fought back racism in the game today. And he says, I'm going to take the vestiges of racism away from Clemson University. That Monday, he ordered all the white only signs and colored signs taken down from the university and on the entire campus. And there was a picture of a work guy with one of those canvas push carts with all these signs in it. And I wish I could get a copy of that. I used to have that. But I think that was probably my proudest moment, certainly my mother's proudest moment. And she stayed there, their home for the weekend. <laughs> it was home and they stayed friends until he died. So that was a, a nice thing about it. The, the Clemson experience. How, how close are you still today to those teammates of yours that played with you at Maryland and saw what you had to go through uh, during your, your, your time at Maryland? Was Shiner the quarterback? He was in 61. Nick, Nick Shiner was a quarterback. Yeah. We close. You know, his son and I uh, communicate quite frequently. I, I think the, the most interesting guy is Brian Piccolo. Sure. Who Wake Forest? Who, we went down to Wake Forest, and he was their big hero and the best player to play at, at Wake Forest at, up until that time. And you know, you see this the movie Brian song, you know, with Gail Sayers. Uh, this guy was really that guy. So they were, as typical in many of those southern state arenas, the fans were always the problem, not the players. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, so Piccolo, they were, they were cheering, you know, get the dirty in off the field. The, the entire stands, <laughs> you know, they're standing up. Get the, <laughs> and Piccolo walks over and puts his arms around my shoulders and turns towards the cheering section and goes. <laughs> wow. You could have heard, heard a pin drop in that joint. And he was their biggest hero, but he ran the risk of losing favor by doing that. And that was a courageous thing to do. You just don't real, you know, those younger people today can't realize how serious oh, yeah. that, that was. So, I mean, when I saw a movie, Brian song, I said, that's the guy. That's his the guy daughter put his arm around me. Yeah. Yeah. His, and his daughter still communicates, you know, with me now, uh, which is very nice. Did it 
did it get easier for you the second year and third year at Maryland? When you got to be a it, it wasn't it wasn't as dramatic, you know, the following year as it was that initial year. Correct. Yeah. But by that time, you know, those schools they in the in the public had gotten used to me being around. But as but again, the whole time I was at Maryland, there were no other blacks. I never I never went on a football field against another African with another African American player against on opponent or otherwise. Oh, that's not true. That's not true. We 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 played like Penn State, you know. They had they had African Americans. Uh, and I think we played Syracuse, Penn State, couple, you know, a couple of northern schools. But essentially, no southern schools. Oh, no southern. No, 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 none of the southern schools. No, no. Then you get to the pros, and things are a lot different. I'm I'm assuming a lot different. What you got to the NFL. Oh, for, yeah, they were a lot bigger and a lot faster, <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> and a lot tougher, you know, we, for some reason, and this is interesting, you know, University of Maryland, Eastern Shore, and the Jets had four or five players from UMES, Emerson, Boozer, sure. uh, you know, Art Shell. Oakland Raiders. Yeah, Johnny Sample. Jets, Ro Roosevelt, Greer, Giants. Yeah, these dudes are all all pros and stars. It, right now, today, I'm trying to help the University of Maryland Eastern Shore because they had to shut down their football program for monetary reasons, and it's an historic black football program that should not have to die. Uh, so. Uh, any help that can be given in that direction is appreciated. And I'm going to try to, because, you know, those, those guys, I don't know how they all wind up in, on the Jets, <laughs> but uh, I think it was because Weeb Eubank was a coach at the Colts. And then he went to the Jets. And being here in Maryland, he was familiar with University of Maryland, Eastern Shore. And he, he brought these, these guys in there. Uh, but, uh, you yeah, First week of practice, first live scrimmage, right, <laughs> with the Jets. And they had a cornerback, his name was Johnny Sample. And he was, we called him Dirty Reds because he had red hair, he was a black guy with red hair. <laughs> but he was a bad dude. I, I don't want to say bad, A, hey, but you know what I mean? He was tough. Oh yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, went, I went down, out and up. And when I broke up, he just punched me right in the face. <laughs> Bam! It knocked me off my feet. I said, Red, what you doing, man? Just practice. He said, look, rookie, you pull up next to me with your speed, I'm beat. So I ain't going to let you embarrass me. I said, I'll take the 15 yards and you take the punishment. He said, welcome to the NFL. So I said, there you go. Harold, you'll enjoy this story about Johnny Sample. When I was the public address announcer for the Cleveland Browns, Back in 1961, two, three, before I went to New York in 1964, we did the public address announcing on the sidelines. So I had a hundred yard cord and wherever the ball was, that's where I was. And the Cleveland Browns had a guy that wore number 32. Yeah, I know, I know that guy. Oh yeah, I think yeah. I I, you played against you. I'm, I think I'm, I heard of him. <laughs> so here, here, they're playing the Jets and Johnny Sample is the quarterback on the near side, the Brown sideline. All the guys in the sideline, they kept chanting, hey Johnny, here he comes again. Here he comes <laughs> again. And they kept pounding Johnny Sample. Gene Hickerson would pull out, John Wooten would pull out and flatten Johnny Sample. And Brown is part of the end zone. Well, Jim Brown was was somebody you didn't want to see. Oh you, no, no, if, no, you, no, no! If you were a DB, you did not want to see him buried down. I'll tell you that. We were playing a charity basketball game, and I played against. We played against the Cleveland Browns. I had a team in Cleveland. It was a charity basketball game, and Jimmy Brown was on the team. And I went to drive in for the lane. He just flattened me. I mean, he just absolutely laid me out. And I got up, and he said. You know, if you can't take it, Shorty, you shouldn't be playing. <laughs> I, was saying, I said, no problem, Mr. Brown. <laughs> you, you have done so many things for the University of Maryland. You got into fundraising. 
They're responsible for the naming of what then was Capital One Field at, at Maryland Stadium. Uh, you're in so many Hall of Fames. You, you, there's just so many things, Daryl, that you have done as the pace setter and made. I can't think of anybody that comes to mind that's made more of an impact than Daryl Hill has to the University of Maryland. It's got to make wow. it feel like a million bucks. That's saying a lot. <laughs> That's saying. Maryland's had a lot of great athletes and coaches. They have. They have. But none I, went I, through I, what you went through. None went through what Daryl Hill went through. Well, somebody had to do it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, I was young and dumb. But, uh, you know, it, my, I never really focused on the threatening aspects of it. Because, you know, I, I knew it was probably more bluff and bluster than reality. Uh, when I went on the field football team, I was worrying about if I was going to drop a punt or yeah. you know, miss a pass. I, I, I didn't worry much about, you know, the rest of the the, the uh, circus that often was going on around me. But uh, uh, I am proud of the results. And, and um, it... It, it, it worked out well. How about the naming of the field house? Old Cole field house is now Jones Hill field house named after you and Billy Jones who came along a couple of years after you did and broke the barrier in college basketball in the ACC and have your name on that building. That's got maybe the top of the list of all the things you've accomplished. That, that is very, 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 very <laughs> stimulating to say the least. Uh, and, you know, sometimes I look up there and see that name is a beautiful facility, just gorgeous. Uh, it, it it does give you, you know, a, a, a bit of a charge. Uh, <laughs> funny story was one day I was trying to get go into the building to show it to someone and I was at the front door, which is locked, of course, it's a big practice facility, but the players, have a card or they they have a code that they can punch in and they can go in because that's where they their locker rooms are and so i'm standing out there and i couldn't get in and one of the players comes and lets me in he said aren't you daryl hill i said yeah he said Isn't that your name on the building i said yeah he said how come you can't get in <laughs> I, said, I said well <laughs> I said, <laughs> I know. I have I'm not. A, I'm not a student athlete. Oh. And he, he just thought that was, you know, really funny. You know, and then I thought about. It, I said it is kind of funny. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, but you know, Billy and I uh, feel very, you know, gratified with that. And you know, the, the comment that I said in the little film that Billy pointed out. He said, "Look, you know, the the." the the newspaper articles and, and, and all the, the rest of the print and TV, that'll come and go, he said. But the name on this building is going to stay there for a long time. That's, and, right, uh, that's right. I said, yeah, that's a good thing. That is true. How things have changed since you had to dress in that small little dressing room on the, <laughs> east, on the east side of Bird Stadium. I've been in that thing. That wasn't very big. Boy. I go to that locker room at the at the Jones Hill house and I can't believe it. I mean I know. I know. It, it's just incredible. I mean they got customized chairs and automatic massages built into the chairs and you know, it's like comfort and luxury. But uh college football and college sports today, they're they're in the what I we used to call the facility wars, you know, the to recruit players, you gotta you gotta have all the little bells and whistles, and you go into some of these locker rooms, or some of these big programs like you know Alabama, for example, and it's really lavish and plush, and you know, designed to wow the high school recruit to come in there. And so Maryland had to keep up. Maryland took a step past everybody with that one, though. Sure so did. there's nothing like that in the country. Did, did you did you sit in the king's chair where they bring a recruit in? They put uh, him in that chair and spin it around. <laughs> a, a big video uh, of him in high school. Uh, of course I did. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and that's kind of weird. I wish we had a picture of that. <laughs> that's a, that's a great. I mean, that's a great, great uh, attention getter. 
for young yeah, people it is. to come in. It, it is. It is. It, uh, 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 it's like a throne, you know. You're sitting yeah, yeah, there, exactly. Exactly. You're sitting there looking at it. The kids go sitting there, and the parents are all proud. You oh know? yeah, yeah. Katie Dick is our producer of our show tonight with Daryl Hill, the Maryland legend, who broke the color barrier back in 1963. And if we have some questions, Katie, from some of the folks watching, you know, just fire them up there and or just jump in. And uh, absolutely, as, yeah. yeah we, okay, go ahead, Katie. We got a some time for a couple questions. Um, if you have a question and you just want to unmute, you can go ahead. All right. There we go. Hey, Daryl, I got a question for you, buddy. Uh, yep. it's Johnny, thanks for the uh, amazing interview. Uh, my name is Mike. Daryl, I, I was curious, um, you know, there it, in the video and then, you know, you talked about this today, like how everybody kind of treated you, um, or, you know, your teammates, the your fellow students, everything. What was the treatment like of your family? Like if your mom, did your mom come to the games when you went <laughs> to, uh, you know, like Alabama, like did any of those Southern schools, like did, did your family ever travel with you? What was it, you know, what was their take on all this? How were they treated? Well, uh, my mother went to every game at home and away. My father had a trucking business and payday, Saturday was payday. And back in, back in the day, you know, most, truck drivers for example did, didn't have bank accounts so you know pay was done in cash and so you know they were expecting their pay so but basically pop could come to the home games at maryland where he could get back in time to make payday but he couldn't go on the trip so she went alone or she went with my younger brother who was you know maybe 15 at the time uh and they they traveled down. She went to every single game, and uh, they they were at Wake Forest again. Wake Forest was a tough. Winston Salem was a tough place to play. You know, next next to Clemson, that was that was tough, and they uh, wouldn't let her in initially. Then when she came in, they were blocking her way to try to walk up the stands, you know, nobody put their hands on it, but they were threatening. And some Maryland fans had to come down. They saw this going on and they came down and sort of rescued her and, and took took her with them. Uh, so it, it wasn't all that safe back there. And she had a lot of guts. And she's a little woman. She, she never weighed a hundred pounds. So, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that would worry me more, more than what was going to happen to me. Yeah. Mm. Well, thank you very much. Thanks again. Sean, thank go you. ahead. I'm sorry, Katie. Uh, uh, Daryl and, and, and Johnny, thank you for being here tonight. Um, this video is probably going to be watched by high school students and maybe even middle school students in the future. So I guess my question is going to is with them in mind. One, uh, Daryl, was there ever a moment uh, during your collegiate career where you stopped and thought, why am I doing this? And and then the second part of that is, um, where did you find the courage and the strength to to do it you know, every year? Well, may I humbly say that I don't think I was all that brave. <laughs> I think, like I said, maybe I was young and dumb. What I did realize is that for the most part, people were just trying to frighten you. That you know, that not necessarily viewing it as a threat. I learned earlier in the game that the players were not going to execute any, you know, violence on me unnecessarily. Uh, what could they do? You know, there may be a little late hit every now and then. Uh, so, you know, for example, I, I got knocked unconscious again at Wake Forest, by the way. And the uh, EMTs wouldn't apply oxygen to it. Jerry Fishman had to run over and push the EMT away from the machine and, and went and put the mask. And the EMT said, we're not putting that mask on his face. <laughs> so, you know, that, that kind of stuff would happen. I'm not sure that it, 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 take, it took any special courage. I certainly never questioned my decision to go there. Uh, or to play football for Maryland. And uh, the experience was was warm and lasting. And for example, uh, 
right before the season started, they had a team, a meeting with the team without me. Some kind of way they arranged me for, I had a doctor's appointment or something anyway. I, I didn't go to this team meeting that was done on purpose. And they asked the team, all right, when we go down south, can we, what, we going, what are you going to do if, if Daryl can't stay in the hotel where the team stays? And, and the team voted and said, he don't stay, we don't stay. We had a couple of dudes on the team who weren't in keeping with that. <laughs> I hate to say it, but Fishman finally dealt with them <laughs> along the way. Uh, one of them late hit me one day in practice and Fishman just clobbered him. <laughs> Said, if you ever do that again, you won't walk. <laughs> he, was, he was a tough guy. Uh, but to have the team do that was, was very supportive. They were totally supportive of everything I did. Uh, very first game with University of South Carolina. But in South Carolina, we couldn't stay at the Hilton in Columbia, South Carolina, where the team usually stayed. So we had to go to a motel, sort of on the skirts of town, one of those kind of strip motels, where we could book the whole place so that no white, South Carolinians would come in contact with this one black kid. That's that's how serious stuff was down there at the time. Uh, and I could see the uh, unhappiness on the face of my teammates, like, oh my God, we got to stay in this little dinky joint. <laughs> but the black staff at the hotel were just wound up because I was there. They started bringing pecan pies and watermelons and to do the rooms that night. And when we got on the bus, they gave us all lunch bag with fried chicken and so forth. And my teammates said, hey, this is all right. This is a motel because they, they took care of them. But, uh, it, you know, there was full support. And, you know, I, I, I won't forget it. And you know, I, you asked the question whether I'm close. I don't, I don't communicate extensively, but we're still close. And you know, I love what they did for me. Is there any advice that you would give to a, a high school student today who's is thinking about going to a school or a program um, that may be a little more challenging, maybe a little uh, not the easiest road to take? Well, the the, the advice is that there. There has to be a leader and there has to be somebody that does it first. And so if, if you if you got the guts in a high school student and you got the guts and the courage and the ability to do it, then do it. Don't back away from a situation because you think it's going to be a little testy, particularly, you know, if you're in the right and, you know, and you're trying to fix something that's wrong. So that's that's really the key to the whole deal. I think a lot of, a lot of times, you know, a, a high schools, especially athletes, uh, are promised all kinds of wild things to go to these different schools. But I advise that they take a good, hard look on what's going on in the inside of these programs. Because as we know, racism still exists in this country. It's just not so overt, overt but it's there. And, I think, you know, as, as a student athlete, pay attention uh, to, you know, what, what you're told and, you know, get as much as advice as you can. I, my suggestion uh, to any student athlete that's being recruited is to try to talk to the local folks if you can. Go in, you know, if you're going into, a, especially a Southern school that's in, you know, one of these, like Tuscaloosa, Alabama, that's all, a football city, more or less. Just make sure you get a feel from the other black players, if you're an African American player, or the the people in the community. What's the deal? Because all the deals aren't the same. So, just a, a question. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Just a question, uh, and not even a question, reaction. Great presentation, great conversation, but. Now the question, I'm on the board at, at this foundation. How do we take your incredible story, your very compelling message out 
further than this. I'm blown away that I've been around sports before and I haven't seen you like tonight. It's a phenomenal message. Um, and Baltimore, Maryland needs to hear it. And I can also say that our foundation that's supporting this will do what we can to take this further. And Sean, I hope I'm not stepping on your toes on this, but how do we do that? How do we get the message of your story and where this community can go as a, in terms of racial equity moving forward? Well, first of all, I, 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 the University of Maryland has, was a part and parcel to what was happening. This wasn't a one man show. And it took a, it took a university, it took a board of trustees to back me, took a president to stand behind me, it took an athletic director, and it took 60 or 70 young men on the football team. I think that that story needs to really be told. Now, I think, you know, I try, one of the things that I'd like to see happen is maybe a major documentary or film that tells a story that takes it to the nation. I think that would have the biggest impact. I think there's enough of a story here to be of interest. And, you know, that my push is to try to get that done, not for Daryl Hill, but for the message it delivers. And well, then, you, I, you've answered my question. We, I, I think we've got a challenge in head, ahead of us, but it's a fun challenge to try and meet. And Sean, don't kill me for that. <laughs> I, I'm on I'm on board Wally I'm on board and I, I think we know a video crew that could do it hey so okay. do I so do I yeah and you know something Daryl I, I think we've come a long way but we still have a long way to go and as the gentleman just said moments ago if they could hear how you handle yourself what you went through how you did it with class and dignity and I'm not going to be stopped attitude. The young people today can take a look at what we've talked about and say, I, I can do something like Daryl Hill. I can make a difference. I can step forward and let my voice be heard. And that's the name of the game. I think in this day and age, when we have so many different things that we can work on, number one would be, the race relations that everybody should be treated equally. Nobody should have to go through what you went through. But uh, all I can tell you, it's an honor and a pleasure to spend the amount of time that I've spent with you, Daryl, over these years. And every time we talk, I learn something new that I never knew before <laughs> that, that you went through. And, and uh, it's to kick off our speaker series like this with someone like you, uh, it's absolutely incredible to hear your stories. Well, I'm humbled by that, Johnny, and uh, and I hope it does some good. You know, and I, and I firmly believe that that this story could inspire a lot of young people, and I think it could just have a positive yeah. effect on the overall attitude of the nation in general in terms of race relations. Uh, because my story is about how in reality, and just like the gentleman who said, you know, it was hard to not cheer for you. And, and I think we got to deliver that message that we're better off together than we are apart. And, and, and this story can, could deliver that sense of together, togetherness. And, and it has enough other interesting aspects, you know, so it will sell, it will sell tickets, you know, which is name of the game. You got to oh, pay yeah. for these things. Uh, you know, the whole deal of first is football, you know, and then, you know, which is interesting in itself. And, and then this whole idea with the Jewish kid and the black kid, you know, the, 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 the sort of the friendship sort of love hate relationship not hate but you know love and yeah. you know push relationship that we had with each other and also how uh people you know reacted and how there were supportive people in in my world like brian piccolo for example uh 
that could be a very, very telling, could very, very telling. And I think uh, it, it, it would go a long way, particularly in light of what's going on in the country right now. I agree, uh, I agree. Before we let you go and before we say good night, bring us up to date and what you've been doing business-wise because you've gone a lot of different directions, all successful directions, I might add. <laughs> okay, well, uh, you know, I started, uh, I started in minority business development after after football, and uh, you know, I, I I felt strongly that uh, racism and discrimination was halfway based on economics. So, if if you got if you sit and all have an equal piece of the economic pie, it's hard to have someone kind of look down on you necessarily. Uh, so, you know, I was striving, and, and 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 there's a lot of focus on jobs, which are important. But business ownership is also very important. And it's, it's important for minorities to have businesses. After that, you know, I wound up in, in Russia, uh, which I kind of laugh, you know, because some of these things that I'm seeing going on now, well, it's not funny, but <laughs> Russia's changed a tremendous amount since I was there. And, and, you know, and the Russians, and I was in Siberia, I was in the timber business and had a pulp mill and, for an optical company, and, and uh, but they never saw me as a black man. They just saw me as an American businessman. Mm -hmm. And you never had that feeling that you get here, you know. So they they didn't care who you were, you know. What they wanted to do is, can I get part of that American pie? <laughs> oh yeah, slice of that pie, right? You got a slice of that pie. But the final thing that, that now, just fast forward into now, uh, I'm in the legal medical cannabis business. So I own cannabis dispensaries here in Maryland and in California, and I'm working uh, to do some bigger and better things in the cannabis industry. And again, I'm trying to be a leader in the groundbreaker, you know, as is happens in almost all circumstances in this country. Blacks are the last ones to be invited to the table. So this is a brand new business and equal opportunity. And the beauty of this business is different than what say my dad had to deal with. When you're coming along and you go for a job or business or try to do something and you're asked, well, did your daddy do it? Did your granddaddy do it? Did you, obviously not. <laughs> they, they weren't allowed to do it, you know? <laughs> And so cannabis is new. Nobody can have that question because nobody, in theory, granddaddy was in that business. So I think it's a perfect opportunity, you know, for minorities to participate. So I'm out front now crusading for fairness and equality in the cannabis industry uh, for minority and ethnic minorities uh, in, in, uh, in, in this, I think it is, one of the fastest growing industries in America. So that's that's my uh, objective. And maybe after this, I'll sail off into the sunset. <laughs> Not anytime soon, believe me. I, hope I don't mean I don't mean literally. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> Girl, thank thank you very much. This kicks off the Babe Ruth Museum speaker series, and we couldn't have picked a better person to kick it off than Daryl Hill. It's been an honor and a pleasure, believe me. Johnny, I thank you. I humbly accept your, your, your warm words, and thank you very much. You bet. If you'd like to get more information, go to baberuthmuseum.org. They'll tell you about the speaker series coming up. Speakers like uh, Joe Madden, the former Major League Manager, Hall of Fame broadcaster, former voice of the Orioles, uh, John Miller, and there's a whole list of other speakers that'll be along with us as we continue with the speaker series. On behalf of the Babe Ruth Museum, on behalf of Daryl Hill, and behalf of everybody at the University of Maryland, I'm Johnny Holiday, and thank you for being with us. Happy holidays to all of you, and good night. Hey.